So now let's talk about our focus topic. Now, our focus topic today is state milk pricing and supports, and we're going to be doing this in a couple of parts, um, and I'll explain a little bit about why we're doing it, and then we'll start going forward. Um, the uh, You may recall, and from the screens that uh, um, were shown at the beginning of this webinar, two, uh, actually more than two of our prior um, quarterly dairy legal webinars were in some way, shape, or form about dairy pricing. Some of them were about the, the uh, federal milk market order reform. Some were about just generally understanding uh, dairy pricing. Uh, and then we had one that was very specific. Our very last one was very specific to Pennsylvania. And we uh, so we have done prior webinars in this series on um uh, the federal system, as well as the Pennsylvania system. I'm going to do a tiny recap at the beginning, just to sort of get your head into it. I would certainly recommend that if you want the, uh, you know, a level of detail and an understanding, go back and, and look at those old webinars uh, to pick that up uh, as sort of a foundation for this particular webinar. Next one uh, that we're doing in July, I guess, is going to be a part two of this. This particular uh, webinar is simply going to be talk about state milk pricing systems uh, or schemes, so to speak, uh, and not in a bad way, um, uh, that uh, are in the eastern states. And then we're going to talk, excuse me, that's our topic today. Then we're going to talk about the western states and midwestern states in part two in July. Um, now, why are we talking about state mill pricing system as well? Uh, not only do we are we in the midst of uh, the federal order reform uh, process, which could shuffle the entire deck here with regard to what and how states might do their own programs. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but we're also in uh, a situation where in Pennsylvania specifically, um, we have on the table uh, various uh, historical statements that have been made um, by members of the Pennsylvania uh, uh, legislature, uh, and in particular the uh, Senate Ag Committee chairman, that there would be an examination of the milk marketing law, which is the home and the authorizing legislation for Pennsylvania's individual milk pricing system. So we may also someday soon see a shuffled deck with regard to uh, Pennsylvania's own system. So let's just go forward uh, with those preliminary sort of comments. Um, obviously, you, you know me by now, um, and there's my email address in case you have any questions. Please just go ahead and feel free to email me anytime on any issue, and, and of course, that includes dairy issues. Okay, so um, let's go back to, and we're going to try to stay up here at the 40,000 foot view for this particular webinar, thank goodness. And I will try once again to try to cover this topic in a way that is understandable and coherent. I'm probably benefited by the fact that we're not going to get as far into the weeds this time as we have at other times. But how is the producer price of raw milk set? In other words, you know, milk is one of these raw agricultural commodities whose price is not established entirely by market forces. And, um, you know, that, you know, there are, the um, uh, certain vestiges of uh, other um, pricing or, or involvement, let's just say, of governmental entities, whether they're federal or state, in other ag commodities, but very few. Milk is clearly the one that has the most governmental involvement and the, the most, um, you know, the, the silent hand of the market is not alone on um, this particular issue of establishing a producer price uh, of raw milk to dairy producers. Uh, no news to uh, our attendees, I'm sure. Now, you know, the federal milk marketing order formula, you know, is of course adopted, maintained, and amended by a vote of milk producers as a marketing order. And marketing orders are are, are, are authorized at the federal level, as well as most states um, have a an ability to have a marketing order in their state. And marketing orders uh, ultimately sort of have their origin in um, uh the need for the commodity or the producers of a particular commodity to, or the desire, shall we say, uh, of those producers to um, create some type of um, controls over or, contr or participation in, shall we say, the establishment of uh, uh, market prices for this particular raw agricultural commodity. Um, 
And, um, you know, not a favored thing. I mean, this is obviously not a totally free market activity. This is something that is bordering on other, uh, you know, economic systems that, you know, people uh, uh, obviously are aware of. And um, so is this pure capitalism? No, it is not. Um, so now everything, you know, at the federal level goes back to the 1937 uh, Agricultural Marketing Agreement Act. There were some predecessors uh, of various permutations. and, and, and uh, But this is the act um, that from which the federal system arises or is at this point attributed to be the act from which the federal system arises. Uh, most of it is is by various revisions and amendments since 1937, and of course the wholesale set of regulations that it, that are the federal uh, milk marketing orders uh, have changed drastically over the years, and will continue to do so as we've seen from the reform efforts. And of course, we're all familiar with the federal milk marketing uh, order areas. Uh, there's 11 of them uh, at the present time. So there is your. Um, Essentially, the you know the regs for the federal milk marketing order system and for setting prices for raw milk uh, to producers uh, start um, at the federal level with these uh, these eleven milk marketing orders, which are essentially made part of federal regulations um, and uh, promulgated by the Department of Agriculture after a vote of producers and an adoption, and they continue to be maintained. And we've covered all of that in past webinars, so I won't uh, uh, go any further on that. Concept, to, to just put, to take away from this brief review of the federal system is that essentially what the federal system is doing is, while there are uh, different uh, prices, or let's do it this way, the market left to its own devices would pay differently uh, for um, raw milk that is used in cheese, powder, fluid milk, et cetera, because the processor can uh, can charge more money for certain products than other products. And um, so, you know, uh, a, 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 a hundred weight of milk is not uh, essentially worth the same um, in all instances. It all depends on what it's being used for, or it's not worth the same to the processor. Let's put it that way. Well, so class one is obviously the fluid milk. That is the the thing that the or the type of milk that the uh, market will pay the most money for. So this federal system is based on this concept that essentially you're taking uh, those 11 markets uh, areas and you're pooling the revenue from all of, and this is on paper now, you're pooling the revenue, the, the actual reality is much more complicated, um, uh, you're pooling the revenue uh, that is generated with, by all milk producers within that market area, that federal order area, uh, for all classes, for milk that is sold for all classes of milk. And then in the pool, a mathematical calculation essentially arrives at a uniform producer number for all or price for all producers within that uh, marketing area that no longer distinct or, or no longer has that, um, uh, you know, those differentiation between classes uh, and what the utilization of the milk was, whether it went to a cheese plant or a fluid plant or whatever. It's simply creating an ultimate uniform producer price that everyone in that market area, every dairy farmer is going to get. Um, now, that's a very, very significant oversimplification simplification, but the concept is to take the highest price milk that nets the most money and use a little of that income by putting it in a pool with all of the other revenue from lower classes and less less financially uh, you know beneficial uh, uh, you know uh, quantities of uh, of raw milk shall we say and then even it all out so that there's some degree of sharing of the wealth that comes from the higher price classes of milk and then the order pool essentially creates that and then out of that arises a uniform producer price so that farmers are getting more equitably paid across the spectrum um, and not subject to we don't want to say the whim, but the whim of processors in terms of what utilization is put to that milk. So anyway, um, that's what a pooling order is, uh, sort of, uh, and you know that hopefully that's understandable. And that's what the federal system is based on. Saying all this so that you can hold on to that concept if you're not, you know, all that familiar with these things. And we will see it again in some of these state systems. Okay, now, of course. 
to talk about state pricing, you have to start with the premise that, of course, there's no federal preemption just because USDA administers a system of marketing uh, orders that does price raw milk in this pooling system to try to create this uniform producer price that evens out, you know, how the market treats different milk differently um, price wise. Uh, but that's not a, that's there's no there's no federal preemption there. States can enter this field, too. Um, now they got to be careful, and then they they can also be out of their um, you know constitutional bounds in terms of interfering with uh, 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 interstate commerce if they are doing things that are um, uh, potentially uh, trying to impact um, you know milk that is from out of state or uh, is uh, may enter their state at some point in the chain. But uh, you know this. The states need to keep their pricing system uh, within the boundaries of their state in terms of um, uh, the impacts and what um, mandates they're making, et cetera. Now, complicated way to say uh, states need to watch watch their P's and Q's when they're creating a uh, state's pricing system so as not to violate the Constitution's Commerce Clause. And, uh, you know, most of us are probably familiar with those concepts. Now, um, you know, interference with market forces through government mandated pricing is certainly a controversial um, uh, concept, you know, to say the least. Um, you know, but you think common sense would say, you know, wouldn't a state, um, uh, you know, assistance to dairy farmers through, uh, you know, an additional state pricing system that may produce more money than the federal system produces? Um, you know, the federal system is really based on this minimum concept, um, and it's a floor, and it's not a very satisfactory floor to many people. Yes, the market can bring more than the federal order price, of course, depending on market circumstances. Um, you know, these are floors. These are, that's a minimum price. And, um, but, you know, it's an unsatisfactory system. That's why we have federal mar milk marketing order reform going on and is always so hotly discussed and debated. And, you know, we don't need to re rehash all that here, but you would think, Boy, isn't this a feel-good win-win kind of thing for a state legislature to get involved in this to benefit their dairy farmers? You know, that's that's really a you know that's sort of a a feel-good story that you'd think would uh, be very popular uh, for state legislatures to to get involved in this and authorize state pricing systems. Well, not actually the case. Um, and I think there are a lot of states that simply look at the circumstances and say, uh, the federal government's taking care of this. That's complicated enough. We don't understand it. It's too, it's too, you know, complex an industry and a system in the Fed. We don't want to interfere with that. We got commerce clause concerns. We don't want to, we don't want to get sued. You know, there, there's a reticence to become involved for sure. Now, um, we're going to talk about uh, classified pricing si pr uh, programs or uh, pricing systems in the eastern states, and there are four of them. Pennsylvania, which we've already dealt with in this webinar uh, or in this webinar series. Maine has a system very unique and interesting. New York has a system that is pretty much just a, a, a re, um, reconstruction of the federal system within their state. Uh, for parts of their state that are not covered by federal orders, which is mostly the Western New York area. And then Virginia has their own system too, which we'll talk about. In the following webinar, we will deal with Midwest and Western states. Okay, now, Pennsylvania has this, basically this three-part minimum pricing scheme that's administered by the PA Milk Board, it used to be called the Pennsylvania Milk Marketing Board until, you know, just uh, a few months ago. And um, and it, the three the three tiers or the three parts are a minimum producer price that may or may not include an additional thing called the overorder premium, which is this state created extra lump of cash, shall we say, um, that is for um, milk that was utilized as class one. So unlike the federal federal system, Pennsylvania's extra producer bump, so to speak, or kicker that, you know, uh, dairy farmers can, uh, you know, can receive due to state law in Pennsylvania for the raw milk. It's only for class one utilization. Now that creates, you know, a, a lot of dissatisfaction with the, the circumstances here with our state pricing system. Yes. Uh, however, it's been in existence for quite a long time. And, you know, uh, and then there's a minimum wholesale and a minimum retail for class one, which is essentially a way of saying to the uh, wholesalers and the retailers, well, Mr. Wholesaler, 
we are the state government making you pay a little extra to a Pennsylvania dairy farmer that you sourced from. So we're going to give you the, the ability to recover that by uh, factoring that into a price buildup of a minimum wholesale price. That is your guaranteed margin of, uh, you know, your guaranteed minimum margin uh, on your sales of the processed product to the grocery industry. And then the minimum retail sales uh, or the minimum retail price is the way of saying from the state government, okay, Mr. Retailer, we know we may, we're making you pay a little more a mandated price as a minimum wholesale uh, uh, price. And so because we're doing that, we will give you a minimum retail price under which uh, it will be illegal for anyone to sell milk, and you will be guaranteed in that price buildup that makes up the minimum retail. You'll be, be guaranteed at least a basic, uh, you know, uh, um, margin uh, on that also. So no one is selling at a loss, neither the processor nor the retailer. Um, and so that's a way of keeping everybody happy with the system that is that the state is mandating a little extra kicker for class one util utilized milk. And of course it has to be produced, processed and sold in Pennsylvania. And there's all sorts of you know mechanisms for uh, governing that. But that's the basic concept that we have here in Pennsylvania. And this is sort of a graphic illustration of it. You know, the price, the raw milk prices has the federal order price, which does come from commodity markets, but then has, you know, what we'll just call government uh, I don't want to call it interference. It has government um, uh, alteration, shall we say, to establish the federal order uh, pool and then this uniform producer price. Um, and then in addition to that, you have the Pennsylvania at this time when this graphic was made, it was still called the Milk Marketing Board, now the Pennsylvania Milk Board. And that's what creates the overorder premium in addition to the federal portion of the raw milk price that producers are getting. And then here's the minimum wholesale price and the minimum retail price. So that's the three-part system that we have in Pennsylvania that um, allows for the overorder premium to exist and not be damaging to uh, wholesalers or retailers uh, and to try to stop, uh, you know, the, the essentially the race to the bottom, you know, where uh, uh, price wars end up, you know, hurting everybody involved in the industry. And then we get these, uh, the minimum prices that are issued, and I've explained this all in prior webinars, so I'm, I'm going to blow through these particular slides. Um, and, and then we have the, you know, the, the minimum prices that are, to, there's the minimum wholesale, and oh, let me go back for a second. Um, Here's the, you know, the, here's the, the overorder premium at this particular time. Um, and here is another benefit from the uh, milk, uh, Pennsylvania Milk Board, which is that cooperatives get a little bit more for their milk. If you look at these two numbers here for the class one price, uh, cooperatives get a little bit more if they are providing um, uh, various services that um, under the system as designed were uh, uh, or are um paid for uh, or are avoided, let's put it that way, are avoided when you're buying co-op milk as opposed to a, an independent uh, a processor who has their own independent supply and has to pay for some of these things that the co-op pays for. So, all right, and then here we have the minimum wholesale and we have the minimum retail number right here. And uh, so, okay, so that's how it works now. Uh, okay, now let's talk about uh, Maine, New York, and Virginia. And they are picking pieces and they use concepts that we've kind of talked about. And then they inject some new concepts into their state system. Maine system is very similar to PAs. It goes way back to 1935, just like PA system goes back to the 30s. All these systems go back to the 30s. You know, no, no secret that the depression is what caused all this or what, you know, uh, what uh, made legislatures act, let's just say at the time. Um, and there's five members to what's uh, called the uh, Maine Milk Commission. And, uh, you know, the Maine, uh, as you can see from this map of the federal orders, Maine is not in a federal order at all. They are completely unregulated by the federal system. Um, this is the Northeast federal order, and it does not include Maine. Um, so uh, that's one explanation for why Maine is, you know, uh, does something of their own. Um uh, now, this uh, and this this particular um, uh, uh, state system uh, actually does 
create or does have an overorder premium concept. Uh, and they have a second cut premium that's called a cost of production premium, which is a guarantee of some degree of a margin to dairy uh, producers based upon um, costs of production being calculated and a margin being included in there. That doesn't exist in Pennsylvania. So that's that's a completely different concept that Maine has incorporated in that Pennsylvania does not have. Their their overorder premium is, is almost identical to Pennsylvania's. Um, and um, the um, uh, uh, so let's go forward and I'll explain to you. There's a little quirk in the in the system that gets a little funny. Uh, now, um, here is how this is. This is a uh, just was a proposed order from a recent meeting of the Maine Milk Commission. And as you can see, OK, here is. <clears throat> Here is really probably down here uh, at the bottom uh, where I put the little blue star. This kind of shows you what how Maine's milk pricing system works in a nutshell. You have the class one price, which is the federal order price. You have Maine's milk commission premium, which is uh, their equivalent of the over order premium. And, uh, you know, they do the same thing, hold hearings to establish that. Um, uh, and then there is a producer margin or in the, you know, that it's actually technically called, what is it called? The cost of production premium. But then they seem to call it producer margin uh, a, a lot of times. And and then that's what we have there. So you see their equivalent of an overorder premium um, is uh, uh, essentially a dollar close to where we are and have been for a while. And now their, their extra premium, which is this um, cost of production uh, uh, premium, is uh, hovers in around this, you know, uh, dollar and a half mark. Um, so they have a bigger bump there, so to speak. They got a they have a bigger state bump to their milk checks than, you know, Pennsylvania does. Um, now, uh, we'll get to the class one thing in a second here because it gets very uh, odd. So here is the class, the total class one producer price. Whoops, excuse me. Sorry about that. Here is the uh, total class one producer price as established by um, uh, the Maine Milk Commission. Uh, and so uh, you can compare that if you know anything about the Pennsylvania price for, this was a, technically, I think the price for January, um, uh, technically. Uh, so. So that's essentially how their price, how their producer price is set by their state system. Um, and then they also, uh, this is um, the uh, the bump to the minimum uh, wholesale. Um, and they have a, uh, I don't know if this 47 cents uh, is the entire margin they're guaranteeing in their minimum wholesale because that gets into some weeds that I am not able to mow through. Um, uh, in any event, here, this tells you a little bit about the gap, the, the per gallon price. Here is the minimum wholesale up here on the top chart. And here is the minimum retail that they set because they have these two extra premiums in there. They have to build those into the promised and guaranteed minimum wholesale and minimum retail that um, essentially makes this tolerable to the processors and retailers that you are bumping up, you know, the main uh, dairy producers uh, raw milk price, their producer price. And so um, you see very similar to Pennsylvania in that regard, but they have a little quirk. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, all of this is only on milk that's it can, can only be on milk produced, processed, and sold in Maine. Otherwise, there's potential for um, you know, engaging in extra jurisdictional uh, authority that they don't have uh, or violating the Commerce Clause. So there's really two groups of producers in Maine. They divide it into the main market producers who ship to plants that are not subject to the federal order, which there's only about 14 in, the, in that neighborhood of those. And then there's the Boston market producers who ship to plants who are subject to the Northeast order. And there's about 130 or so of those. You can see 145 total dairy farms is, uh, you know, obviously a whole different world than we're dealing with here in Pennsylvania. But in any event, um, so plants subject to the federal order, in other words, that's going to be the plants that are um, uh, feeding the Boston market and, you know, sending their milk down there, but they may in fact be located in Maine, but they're still under the Northeast um, 
uh, federal milk marketing order, order number one. So they're mandated to, pl to pay the Maine Milk Commission's two producer price premiums, uh, which is this overorder and, excuse me, did it again, which is the overorder and this producer margin premium. Um, and then on, on milk utilized in Maine, which means it has to be the, the wholesale sale ends up going, uh, you know, happening in Maine um, and, and doesn't get shipped into the, you know, the the Maine or excuse me, the Boston market. And then plants uh, actually, excuse me, that is for the plants that go to Boston. Um, so they have to they have to exclude out, you know, the percentage that isn't utilized in Maine. And then plants that are not subject to the federal milk marketing order, which is a much, much smaller, uh, um, uh, you know, quantity of milk, let's just say, uh, they mandate the federal order price um, because those, you know, those people aren't even guaranteed that because they're not selling to a, a, a federal order regulated uh, processor. Um, and they also operate their own tiny little main milk pool you know, uh, which is apparently just for these 14 producers milk. And they do the basically the same thing. They even out and create a uniform uh, producer price from the ver various classes um, that are you know, or class prices that are being paid. Um, and so, you know, they they do an equivalent of the federal pooling system to create a uniform producer price in the areas where uh, the uh, where they're are or for the dairy farmers, I should say, who are selling to uh, processors who are not feeding the Boston market. Um, uh, so um, that's an interesting twist on the whole thing. They're actually running their own pooling process in Maine. Very small, um, but it does produce a uniform producer price for those who are not selling to a federal uh, uh, regulated uh, uh, processor. Um, so that's and, and and actually Maine has one other thing that's very interesting. They have this destructive competition law, which is a it's unlawful for any dealer or retailer store retail store to sell milk or fluid for fluid consumption at less than the cost thereof to the dealer or retail store with the purpose or intent to injure competitors or destroy competition. So they have this little belt and suspenders approach, which is not only do they have um, these minimum wholesale and minimum retails um, pricing. Uh, then in, for their sales to non-regulated plants, I think that's right, unless I misspoke there, uh, but they also have this little, you know, this sort of the belt, the extra, uh, uh, the extra statutory uh, provision that essentially puts the stop on, you know, the uh, uh, the race to the bottom. Um, uh, so interesting observation that they have that sort of uh, extra provision. Um, okay, now New York, what does New York do? New York has a milk control law, again, goes back to 1933, and um, they have essentially, it's all controlled within, interesting point, you know, the Pennsylvania Milk Board, uh, used to be called the PMMB, uh, is an independent agency, not part of the Department of Agriculture. So the Secretary of Agriculture, for example, theoretically has no sway over the milk marketing board. Um, and that's generally perceived as, you know, a, uh, as a good government uh, measure to make sure that there is not any uh, influence um, uh, and that they are truly independent um, and are making independent adjudications of what the pricing should be. Um, and the same for Maine. How, although in Maine, the commission is within the Department of Agriculture. Uh, now, in New York, the, um, the the whole process is within the um, Department of Agriculture, but that's because they essentially have a marketing order, just like the federal system. They do not have a commission which mandates prices based on hearings held in that context. And then there's a group, a small group of five, six, eight, whatever it might be, you know, three as in Pennsylvania, who, you know, vote and set the prices. This is a uh, a mechanism for setting the price that was approved by a producer vote, just like any other marketing order. So this is a replica of the federal system within New York. And why is that? Well, as you see, there's this there's this chunk of Western New York that is not in the federal order. So they have that problem of producers that don't even have the protections of the federal order. Um, and so uh, 
that is essentially there's a Western New York milk marketing area official order number 127, which is just like the federal marketing orders and it operates almost exactly the same to fill this void. Now, I believe, although someone here in this call could correct me, that this borderline between the uh, Northeast Federal Order 1 and the white area here in Western New York that is not under federal um, uh, milk marketing order control, um, they match up. Now, maybe I think that they the enumerated list of like these Western New York counties and the portions of counties um, that uh, are subject to this New York marketing order are um, uh, are outside of the uh, of the Northeast uh, Federal Order One. Uh, one of the interesting things is that the uh, 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 the the process for um, uh, the, or I should say the the history of this particular um, Western New York issue is very 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 long, and there have been many permutations, and I can't find anywhere a map. An actual map of New York that shows the current, uh, the sort of the counties and the boundaries of the Western New York milk marketing area. But in any event, that's essentially what they have done, is which is borrowed right out of the federal uh, playbook and using an almost identical system just for Western New York, where um, the federal order does not reach in New York. Um, now, uh, lastly, uh, Virginia. Virginia is an interesting one where they have a state milk commission. Um, but interestingly, um, the uh, uh, you know, two producers on it, five consumers, um, and uh, you know it does in fact independently set you know pricing. This is not by a um, uh, by a marketing order. This is a you know a commission that sets prices um, and uh, is governed by, of course, by a statute uh, and its own regulations. But um, <clears throat> in any event. Um, there is um, uh, a uh, nice publication, which is probably one of the, the, the best things that I could find that talked about, uh, you know, how this exactly operates, which is put out by Virginia Tech Extension. And here's the site to the publication itself. By the way, here you can look at the map. What does Virginia have? Same problem. Big chunk of the state that isn't covered by any federal order. Um, and now. Uh, what they have is what we all know or what people in the dairy industry would call a quota system or a base system, which is um, uh, you purchase milk commission base, MCB, and that gives you the right to sell milk at a higher class one price or to be compensated for your milk at a higher class one price um, equal to the amount of, you know, the base that you have purchased. It's expensive stuff, you know, buying this base and it's sold, bought and sold, you know, through, you know, free, free, uh, you know, market transactions, so to speak. Um, and uh, uh, now uh, here's a little example of how that works. Essentially, this is describing a process whereby, um, you know, the, the, um, uh, uh, the, Standard class one price for non-base milk is 1950, and here's a scenario where the base price, if you've purchased base and it's it's based on volume, uh, but uh, you buy so much of your milk um, to be covered, but in any event, the price per hundred weight is 2275. So that gives you a little picture of the differential between owning base and getting paid at that higher rate versus not owning base, and then. Um, you know, as this is sort of a quote, milk commission base is essentially a certificate to sell the stated amount of milk at a, oops, excuse me, sorry, I did it again, at a premium price each month. Now, you, if you don't use your, um, <clears throat> your base, um, then um, uh, you can actually uh, be penalized and lose it. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, again, it's bought and sold, you know, uh, by auction and in private transactions. Now, the key thing about buying this base is you're buying it with today's dollars, but it's a promise of future income. And, you know, with inflationary factors and everything, you got to make sure that this makes economic sense to you. Uh, you know, there are scenarios where you could buy it and it would not make uh, economic sense. Um, so, you know, you're using future dollars to net, uh, you know, they got to be sort of reduced to present value in order to really know how they are helping you. And particularly if you've borrowed money to buy it, you to buy the base, which is, you know, this is large, this is stuff that's going to take hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy. Um, so that's a si significant, you know, possibility. So, 
Um, you know, and right, the base are, art. Hang on. We are I'm at gonna one o'clock. So All right. I'm going like... to keep going for a few minutes. The, okay. the, the, the milk commission base has a resale value, but that, you know, is always uncertain. So when you invest all this money in buying base to get a better price, then you got to make sure that you understand that when you go to resell the base at some point, it may be worth less than you paid for it. You can't really control that portion of it. So now here is the publication of their prices. Uh, and I'll, I will just go forward uh, and, and you can check it out. Now, this gives you, uh, this graph just gives you uh, an, a graphic representation of the difference between the non base price and the price that you'll get for your milk if you buy uh, the milk commission base. Uh, and it's generally been a consistent, you know, margin or in there that you're buying up to, so to speak. Um, so that sort of gives you a, an idea of what's up in Virginia. So essentially, we have multiple variations on state pr classified pricing programs. There's marketing orders. We've talked about that versus commission ordered mandate uh, mandated prices. We have federal marketing order like market pooling going on in certain circumstances um, that produces a uniform producer price, which helps redistribute the class one wealth to all producers. That's a concept that comes into play here. It's not in Pennsylvania, but it does come into play. And then you have the um, you know the concept of these over order premiums um, uh, that hang on I seem to have there we go over order premiums and, and in you know uh, uh, Maine's case uh, you know a, a, an additional state provided premium that's coupled with minimum wholesale and retail prices so that the people down the line in the supply chain can recoup what they've been made to pay the higher price they've been made to pay by the government. And then you have these base and quota systems. Quota is kind of famous because that's the Canadian system and California has a quota system too, that also is a tool in here. So these are the tools that state pricing systems utilize. So the, hopefully this has given you a general introduction. The next um, uh, session, we will talk about Midwest and Western states. Okay, Audrey, now back to you. I think we'll we'll wrap this up for today. Hopefully we'll see you in July for part two or this Friday for producer protections for buyer defaults. Thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon.